let's uh, get to where we're going. Uh, we're very happy to have Kevin Owen with us tonight and his wife Paula. They live in Summitville, which is just north of Wordsboro, a little over a half hour from here. And uh, they're my neighbors because I also live just outside of Wordsboro. Um, and they're going to be talking about, and I hope I'm not stealing your thunder, but Burlingham, which is also very close to us. It's between uh, Bloomingburg and Middletown, sort of, if you have an idea where that is. And that's just over a half hour from Port Jervis. And uh, so there were a lot of exciting things happening there in the late 1800s. And uh, Kevin, it's all yours. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I want to thank every one of you for coming tonight. Appreciate it. It really means a lot to me. Um, also, the introduction that I'm not sure Fred mentioned, but my wife did the cover design. She's an illustrator and artist, mm -hmm. and um, she'll be back there handing out her book uh, marks, which have uh, basically a promo to her business and Etsy store. Uh, any true crime fans in the house? Yes. <laughs> Thanks for coming. That's how this all started. So be careful. Uh, and, and that's really a question I get most that I'd like to kind of address. How did, how did you write this book? How did it all start? So just getting into that, that I had just finished a true crime book. And it was quite horrific. Uh, I don't even think it was the first time I read it, but it just... Since I was older, I wanted to know more about the case. Regardless, I, I was really curious if any other types of horrible crime, serial killer, murderer, had lived anywhere near me. So after typing a few words into a simple internet search, the results were pointing to not only a series of horrific murders within my local vicinity, but a character whose crimes caught international attention and a woman who was eventually labeled as the worst woman on earth by the New York Times. Even more surprising was how the tale of her crimes had fallen into relative obscure, obscurity and initially researching Lizzie's life led to conflicting information and a trail of confusion for me. It turned out that a small, frail-looking woman had somehow lured two women to her home in Burlingham, as Fred mentioned, right outside of Pine Bush. Lured these two women to her home and, it, and murdered them in a seemingly motiveless crime. Additionally, her husband, thought to be missing, was found later under the kitchen floorboards. My interest was piqued. And I found I was compiling a vast, well, let's see, I think I dropped everything. No? Okay, my interest was piqued and I found I was compiling vast amounts of data needed to sort out this strange enigma, which was Lizzie Halliday's life. I quickly became inundated with stores of information that needed to be fact-checked, sorted, and placed in a timeline of Lizzie's lifespan, if any sense of her crimes was going to make sense. I had a wall next to my computer. It was a long, I had created a long banner and started to place her birth date and her death date and I was attempting to fill in every stage of her life. Because I don't know if anybody searched for her on Wikipedia, but there's about seven paragraphs and they don't all fill the blanks. After I had started to put up sticky notes, taped up newspaper articles, everything just shy of the yarn that you've seen on the Zodiac in the movies, my wife started to get very concerned. <laughs> in short, a true crime, true crime detective was born. To me, a complete biographical timeline of Lizzie's past would be essential in determining the motives, if any, in her murders, and if her defense of insanity was plausible, 
What I found was a startling lifestyle of indefensible crimes perpetrated by the same woman who stood trial in Sullivan County, New York in the late 1800s for three brutal homicides and was suspected of many more. Burlingham, New York in the summer of 1893. There was a quaint slice of rural Americana nestled in the lower Catskill region and had become a favorite getaway for those looking to retreat to the bucolic countryside over the summer months. Most farmhouses in the area cater to the summer boarders. And the following is directly from a document found at the Mamacating Historical, Historical Society. Quote, in 1893, the town of Burlingham had a church, school, town hall, general store slash post office, a sawmill, and a grist mill on the kill. It also had several livery stables, a blacksmith, as well as a wagon shop. Sounds like a movie I've seen once. The late summer of 1893 was to quickly become very different for those visiting as well as those living in Burlingham. The last week of August through the first week of September was to become known as a week of accumulated horrors as dubbed by the Monticello paper called the Republican Watchman of 1893. Uh, basically what all Paul Halliday's neighbors had learned was he was missing. So this is basically the information we have as we learn about the case. Neighbors had reported to Paul Halliday's son, Paul Jr., that his father had not been seen around his own property and that they had become concerned. Paul Jr. visits the farm and is greeted by his stepmother, Lizzie. She explains that his father is not home and shows him a nice ring explaining that it was a gift from Paul Sr. While leaving the property, Paul Jr. notices that the house is being watched by law enforcement. After a time and much discussion, they get a search warrant, but Lizzie won't cooperate. Eventually, to devise, um, Lizzie refused them entry to the house, so they devise a plan to get Lizzie away from the property. She is to escort Constable to Bloomingburg, where Lizzie claimed Paul Sr. had bought some property. While away, the available men would search the house. The group searching the house included Justice Thayer of Bloomingburg. They found a bucket in which Lizzie had been scrubbing a rag rug with a stiff brush. The stain on the rug looked suspiciously like blood. Inside the bucket, they also found a piece of rope that seemed to be stained with blood as well. Looking around the house, they also found an ax handle, which seemed bloody on the end, a crowbar, a bloody board, and two shovels. There was also an extremely large amount of dirt and hay on the floor indoors, which was, when pushed aside, seemed to be covering blood-stained floorboards. They began looking frantically for Paul Sr. as the group was certain he had met with foul play. In the bedroom, the bed was covered in clothing, but when this was pushed aside, they found bloodstained sheets that had been washed recently. A hole was cut in the sheets and was thought to be done to hide evidence. What they didn't find was Paul Sr. Seeing the shovel, they were concerned he had been buried outdoors in the surrounding mountains or countryside, making finding his remains near impossible. Having searched the small house thoroughly, they all went outside to look around. One of the men ventured into the small crawl space under the barn and saw something odd, buried under hay and manure. Upon closer examination, he saw that it was indeed a human arm protruding from the waste pile. He called out to the others searching, and soon the area under the barn was full of the crew searching for Paul Sr. To their surprise, they did not find Paul Sr. in the composting hay. 
what they found was not one, but two bodies. <clears throat> this is an actual crime scene photo of um, the, um, the entrance area under the barn. The constable, uh, a telegram is sent to Bloomingburg. Get Lizzie back here. We got some problems. When Lizzie arrives uh, in Burlingham, her demeanor, I mean, um, yeah, from Burlingham, she starts, her demeanor changes. She starts acting insane. Constable Scott confirms she was completely fine to and from Bloomingburg. <clears throat> This is a crime scene photo of where the victims were found in the compost. Lizzie was held at Justice Thayer's at that point under suspicion of murder. She's questioned, she's questioned about the whereabouts of her husband. As she's held at Justice Thayer, nearby uh, in Wurtsboro, gypsies are overheard planning Lizzie's escape. <clears throat> they are planning to break out Lizzie. Law enforcement then plans to move Lizzie to a proper jail as evidence continues to mount which implies her direct involvement in the murder of the two women. When suddenly, Paul is found. He's been buried underneath the kitchen floorboards all along. Lizzie is transferred to Monticello in an effort to move the case along, but also to prevent her from being rescued by gypsies. <clears throat> In Monticello, we now learn about Lizzie's background. Lizzie would wait a full nine months for her trial as a special session of the Supreme Court was um, Paul. And in that time, the infamous reporter or famous reporter, Nellie Bly, comes and visits Lizzie. Does everybody know Nellie Bly? Kind of a groundbreaking reporter, kind of like Geraldo Rivera in her day. Nellie also brings with her the experience of having um, she did uh, 10 days in the madhouse where she went undercover uh, in New York City, posed as someone who was insane and tried to expose the terrible condition in uh, Blackswell Island, which was like Arkham Asylum <laughs> for the insane, where basically they would take women off the street and lock them away forever. And it was a terrible place. Anyway, since Nellie felt she could break the case. While in Monticello jail, Lizzie gets a visit from reporter Nellie Bly. Nellie Bly first sends reporters to dig up as much information about Lizzie's past as possible. Based on Nellie Bly's interview, we learn much more about Lizzie Holiday and the, and the research of her past we learn, among other things, that Paul Halliday is her sixth husband. She had uh, inferred to Paul and his family that she was had come straight from Ireland just years prior to their marriage. She was she got here as a child with her family. So all of these facts come across, and in fact. Um, She's in her 20s at this point in her life, but her first murder 
may have been when she was 15. I will read from the book. This is based on uh, uh, Nellie Bly and her research. <clears throat> and the first murder was linked to her first husband when she was 15. How Lizzie met her first husband in the fall of 1879 remains somewhat of a mystery. It may have easily been they met as Lizzie took in his laundry and a romantic relationship prospered. Although his real name was Charles Hopkins, he was living under the assumed alias of Keith Spool Brown, having been a deserter from the British Army. Lizzie was 15 years old at the time, and Hopkins was considerably older, as noted by many eyewitnesses, although his exact age could not be found. Charles Hopkins was involved in some very shady dealings when Lizzie first met him. Hopkins was a carpenter in the Greenwich area of New York and performed some work for a wealthy farmer in the region. The farmer, Matthew Dugan, had a housekeeper, a Mrs. Campbell, who, although married, fell for Hopkins, and the two became involved in a secretive romance and pact. Apparently, Mrs. Campbell's husband had traveled to nearby Vermont to work, and his wife was employed as a domestic by Dugan, thus living at Dugan's farm. Hopkins convinced Mrs. Campbell to steal some money from the farmer and give it to him over a period of time. Hopkins convinced the poor, lovesick woman that the money would be used for the two of them to marry and they'd be together forever. Little did she know his true intent was to take the money and terminate their relationship. He eventually accumulated $200 of Dugan's money through Mrs. Campbell, and this is when Hopkins made his actual intentions clear to her. Around this time, Hopkins was also romantically linked to Lizzie and was seeing the two women at the same time. At this time, Charles Hopkins wrote Mrs. Campbell a letter explaining his scheming plan and how he would never right the wrong he had done to her and their relationship was over. Mrs. Campbell was relentless in her pursuit for Hopkins' affection and tried to keep in contact with him and mend the past in some way. She was not convinced the relationship was over and she still loved old Hopkins dearly and wanted to be by his side forever. Since Lizzie had become involved with Hopkins, she did not seem to appreciate the attention Mrs. Campbell was giving her new man and felt quite jealous. Lizzie described in a later interview how Hopkins had always had some woman coming about and visiting with whom he had once been acquainted. According to Lizzie's version of events, Mrs. Campbell had given the stolen money to Hopkins to hold and Mrs. Campbell was now looking to retrieve it. Shortly afterwards, Mrs. Campbell was found dead in her bed. On her nightstand stood a bottle of poison, which she had apparently taken a fatal dose of before retiring for the evening. Although there was no note found, her death was ruled a suicide, and nothing else was made of the loss of her life. Lizzie continued to describe Hopkins as a bad man, and in a later interview admitted she had overheard Mrs. Campbell complaining of some illness to Hopkins, and that Hopkins gave her a bottle, telling her it was medicine to cure her ailment. Perhaps then Mrs. Campbell was just a trusting soul because she took the liquid Hopkins gave her, thinking it was medicine, when it was actually the poison that resulted in ending her life. This may very well be the start of a criminal pattern for Lizzie, as we see later, she often reports events that happen in a way that blames others and portrays herself as an innocent bystander. This may well be the first documented death we can directly or indirectly contribute to Lizzie Halliday. It's very plausible that Lizzie was an accomplice or devised the plan entirely. Poison typically thought of as a woman's method of murder no offense, lady. <laughs> and, and not usually the choice of men when committing premeditated homicide. So, if we were to have a little counter here, probably tasteless, Lizzie death counter, where would you guess it is right now? We're just saying she's sitting in Monticello, 
two women in the barn, her husband. I just mentioned this woman, Mrs. Campbell. Any guesses? What? I'm gonna guess maybe a few of her other husbands <laughs> might have been victims too. Yes, and Hopkins probably eventually, yeah. right? <laughs> No, actually, can't be proven, unfortunately. Um, a doctor attending Hopkins said he died related to a lung ailment from breathing in. Uh, he worked at a brush factory, breathing in. Unfortunately, no, but the count would be at eight. Wow, wow. Most likely. It's unknown at this time because Lizzie's a person who bragged about being able to get away with whatever she did wrong. And all we have is an account of her getting caught for, for whatever she has done. So we don't know exactly uh, how many murders, but uh, it's thought over the career, uh, her span of her career is at least nine. Okay, well. So she's in jail, but I said eight. Interesting. <laughs> Nellie Bly also found that in 1888, Lizzie was convicted of arson and served time in the Eastern State Penitentiary. Not that any of us were there in 1888, but in March of 1988, there was a historic blizzard that resulted in hundreds of people dying. That evening, of an intense blizzard, Lizzie set fire to her home, grabbed her one and only son by the arm, and set out into the storm. A lot of detail in the book. In 1890, Wurtsboro was an unsolved murder at the lead mines. Lizzie implicates herself in what's detailed in the book. <clears throat> As a result of Nellie Bly's research, further light was shed upon the 1891 series of fires at the Halliday home. The most startling fact that was brought out was that Lizzie, having admitted to her husband to setting the fire that claimed the life of his son, Paul had not reported this crime to the Sullivan County authorities. Not until months later, when Lizzie was arrested in Newburgh, New York, did Paul attempt to have Lizzie charged with arson and murder. It was pointed out to Paul that the crimes had actually been committed in another jurisdiction. Um, this was interesting and very difficult. There was a couple of stories that were alluded to by Nellie Bly's research, but were very hard to find in my research. Uh, this was one of those, what in the world happened? If you read the Wikipedia, you'll see that they say, Lizzie stole a team of horses and eloped with a neighbor to Newburgh. That is not what happened. That's like not even the Reader's Digest version. Um, so these are the things that led to confusion on my part, led me to research more, and led me to write this book. Early in the month of June of 1891, and this is the same year that they were married, okay, 1891, Paul and Lizzie set out for Newburgh, New York, where Paul intended to spend a great deal of money to buy a team of horses for his farm. They took the journey and got to Mrs. Smith's, which I described earlier in the book, Mrs. Smith ran a, um, an employment placement as well as lodging in Newburgh, New York. They got there late on Friday to rent a room for the night and shop for horses the following day. It was at this time Mrs. Smith learned of the tragedy and ill fortune that had fallen upon the Halliday Farm. Paul relayed the tragic series of fires to Mrs. Smith as follows. <clears throat> I'm sorry, lost my place. Paul had left the farm in the 
early morning with two loads of charcoal that were be, to be delivered in Middletown. His son, Johnny, who was developmentally disabled, uh, had been up early with his father in the pre-dawn morning hours helping get, ready, get the horses ready and load the charcoal. When Paul departed, Johnny headed back to his room with a lantern where he was in the habit of doing whittling. Okay, this is Paul's words to Mrs. Smith. Lizzie was ill and bedridden that morning when Johnny rushed into her room in great excitement. He announced that the house was on fire and assisted his ailing stepmother out of the house. Once getting Lizzie safely outside, Johnny returned into the burning house to retrieve many of the household goods and furnishings. It was reported that no furniture burnt with the property. Lizzie had apparently directed Johnny to empty the house. After several trips in and out of the fire, he was overcome by smoke and never came out of the house again. Johnny died on May 4th, 1891, at the age of 37. The coroner report lists the cause of death as accidentally suffocated in a burning building. Although Lizzie stated to Paul she physically attacked Johnny and cut his throat with a bread knife, Roche, uh, the coroner, neglected to mention this in his report, perhaps due to the condition of the body due to the fire or the lack of forensic pathology as we now know it. Uh, at the time, Paul clearly stated to Mrs. Smith that it was Johnny's fault the house burnt down as he was careless with the lantern while whittling. Having spent the night at Mrs. Smith's lodging, Lizzie woke in the morning before Paul and reported many facts to Mrs. Smith in confidence. Lizzie stated that Paul found out she had a bank account in Newburgh with a wrap. $2,500 deposited. Yeah, during that time, that was a lot of money. And wait, this was 1891, I mentioned, right? The peddler who died in Wurtsboro died in 1890. Mm -hmm. At the time, Lizzie was, outlined in the book, Lizzie was living in Newburgh at that time that the peddler was killed. She was not married to Paul. Um... Paul told Lizzie he wanted her to withdraw half of that balance to cover the cost of the horses. He explained in a loud voice that she was his wife. He was entitled half of all her money. Right? Makes sense, ladies, right? Is that the way it works? <laughs> Honey? Um, <clears throat> this didn't sit well with Lizzie, and she spent a great deal of time in complaining to Miss Smith about Paul and their marriage. Um, uh, I'm going to skip ahead, but she basically just says that there's all rocks. All the farming is just a lot of rocks. I mean, that's what it is like around here, gardening, isn't it? <laughs> it's tough. We're growing rocks. Uh, Mrs. Smith claimed she told Lizzie not to leave her husband. Lizzie was now planning to leave and go to Europe. Lizzie left for the day. Uh, let's see. See, Paul woke later to find his wife gone, as well as all the money in his pocket. His pocket had been picked clean, and he was left without a single cent. Once he gathered himself together, he set out upon the city of Newburgh to see where his wife had gone. While out, he would check into the horses that he intended to buy. It would take nearly an entire day of searching, but he eventually found out about a woman matching his wife's description using the name of Jenny Williamson, which made the article hard to find. She was being held by the police for horse theft under the charge of first degree larceny. Upon entering the police station, his suspicions were confirmed. Paul explained Lizzie's real name and asked for his wife to be released into his custody. The police brought Lizzie out to see if this indeed was her husband. She refused to make eye contact with Paul or acknowledge his presence in any way. She began to act insane, talk to herself, yell obscenities, and pick at her clothes. Paul claimed this was an act his wife was playing on them and declared she was not insane. The police informed Paul of the seriousness of the crimes his wife had been charged with and that she was to go to trial and would certainly not be released today. 
Upon learning this, Paul began to plead for the money his wife had had, had taken from his person when arrested. Paul claimed since she had taken all his money, he had not eaten all day and was famished. He was at least entitled to the money that was his when his wife was captured. Paul was informed that none of the money would be released as it was impounded as evidence. For reasons known only to Paul Halliday, it was at this moment he accused his wife of far greater crimes and demanded she be charged with arson and murder of his son Johnny. Paul confessed that he was certain Lizzie had murdered his feeble son by locking him in his room and he had found the key in her robe pocket. She told him in a rage she had killed him by cutting his throat, rolling him up in a carpet, and leaving him in the fire to die. This information, information had not been heard by anyone before, as Paul told other families the same heartfelt version that he told Mrs. Smith. <clears throat> Lizard, Lizzie later recounted in an interview that Paul knew full well of the plan to burn the family home. The plan, which she conceived, was to burn the house for the insurance money. They would use the funds to buy new farm equipment and horses the struggling farm so desperately needed. Lizzie claimed Paul only went off that day to have an adequate alibi. Perhaps Paul did not turn in his wife for arson and murder due to the fact that he had been an accomplice in the plan to destroy the house for insurance money, an illegal activity with which Lizzie was very familiar. Paul certainly did not know in advance Lizzie was planning to kill Johnny and was crushed by the death of his son. He was torn as to what to do with the truth. Shortly after the fire which destroyed the house and killed Johnny, the barn mysteriously burnt down also. Also, just prior to the fires in Birmingham, a neighbor's son, George Klein, went missing and was never found. George was 14 years old, and after Lizzie's wild behavior in Newburgh, neighbors in Birmingham suspected she was responsible for young George's disappearance. <clears throat> These are crime scene photos from 1893. The bedroom and the kitchen where Paul was actually buried. As Lizzie waits in the Monticello Jail, District Attorney David S. Hill builds a case against Lizzie. Although outlined in the book in great detail, Lizzie was found guilty by the jury and sentenced by Judge Edwards to die in the electric chair. Lizzie was the first woman in the world sentenced to die in the electric chair. But there was a flower for Lizzie, Governor Flower. Immediately upon finding Lizzie guilty, Governor Flower appointed a commission to evaluate Lizzie's sanity. By mid-July, Lizzie's examination was complete, and the commission deemed her insane. The governor provided Lizzie with a pardon for her death sentence and sentenced her to the alternative, which was life imprisonment in an institution for the criminally insane. As early as 1895, uh, this is, she was um, eventually made it to Matawan, which is now a closed facility in Fishkill for the criminally insane. Um, <clears throat> this is just a memo from the commissioners appointed to uh, evaluate her. There's a great deal of detail in the book about this. Uh, New York State Mental Health would not release any of the records on Lizzie, but fortunately, the, uh, there are um, medical journals were published discussing her case. 
Uh, and in early as 1895, as Lizzie was incarcerated, she and another resident, Jane Shannon, attacked a nurse, Kate Ward. Although Lizzie was attempting to strangle Miss Ward and had managed to stuff a towel completely into her mouth and down her throat. The asylum labeled this as an escape attempt, and the two inmates were separated, never to be housed together again. In 1901, Lizzie applies for and receives her late husband's military pension. After news of this breaks, the law is changed so that widowers cannot benefit from a husband's pension if the widow killed her husband. There was, there was no <laughs> law like that before. So she's, she's a trend. She said that too. She's Perhaps the most tragic consequence of Lizzie's pardon is the 1906 um, death of a young, ambitious Matawan attendant and corrections officer, Nellie Wicks. Nellie Wicks was the first female correction officer ever killed in the line of duty. Nellie Wicks had grown close to Lizzie. Did that change on its own? Um, <coughs> What she didn't know was that by doing so, she was in grave danger. After announcing to Lizzie her plan to leave Matawan and further her career, Lizzie stopped Nellie Wicks in the only way she knew how. She killed her in an ambush attack and stabbed the poor woman with a pair of scissors over 200 times in the face and neck. We are reminded here of the words of Governor Flower when pardoning Lizzie. I do not think her a fit subject for the death penalty. It would be much safer to commute the sentence to life imprisonment. Question becomes safer for whom? In June of 1918, it was announced that Lizzie Halliday, the worst woman in the world, had died. Lizzie suffered from chronic Bright's disease or acute kidney failure. Lizzie lies in an unmarked grave behind the abandoned Matawan Asylum. Paul, on the other hand, is buried in the Shader Walker Valley Cemetery next to his first wife, Ellen, and his son, Paul Jr. Uh, one thing that I didn't outline in the um, talk was that after killing Nellie Wicks, uh, Lizzie Halliday was sentenced to solitary confinement for the remainder of her life. Um, that didn't last. There were some other issues at the asylum and um, she was eventually brought outside for a walk every day, but that she was still in solitary confinement for the rest of her life. Uh, that concludes the talk. There's much more in the book. Uh, that I just kind of gleaned over. If anybody has any questions. Yes. What happened to her parents and her siblings? Do you have any info on that? Yes. Um, her, when they, they moved to Newburgh, the whole family was living in Newburgh, and her sister, Mary, married in Newburgh, someone by the last name of Long, and he was in the lumber business. Mary stayed there, and by all accounts, uh, her father, John McNally, stayed there. And uh, it was said that he died on the streets of Newburgh out of his mind. That's all I can find. Um, when Lizzie finds out about this from her sister, she was visiting her sister Mary. She found out about it. She got so upset, she went to her father's grave and attempted to dig him up with her bare hands, and she had to be physically stopped. Um, the rest of the family moved up by Greenwich and San, uh, brothers at Sandgate, Vermont, uh, that area right around Albany in uh, Greenwich, New York. Yes? 
How old was she when she died, and how long was she in the asylum in solitary? Uh, I believe she's 56 when she died. Yeah, and um, she had really bad chronic Bright's disease, which is basically they just call kidney failure. So, um, so how old was how she when she went in? She, she was in her mid 20s, like early to mid 20s when she was arrested and in Monticello, then went to Matawan. There's, there is a great deal of detail about uh, her time in Matawan that I could find since it wasn't public information. Yes. I have a question. I know she was Irish, but it said that some gypsies in town were trying to free her yeah. and that somebody said, she, one of the clippings said she was a gypsy girl. Why would somebody want to free her? Did, was she friends with them or what? Why was that? Do you know? Um, it was said, uh, it's outlined in the book that when she was, she was a housekeeper in Newburgh, she would go out and spend all night out. And uh, the woman who ran the house told her, you can't do that here. You do it again, you're gone. And she didn't change her ways. It was thought that she was out with gypsies based upon how she would look when she came back. She looked like she had different clothes on. Uh, she insinuated she knew things about cutting cards or I, I don't know if it had to do with tarot cards or just being great with cards. Uh, um, the gypsies were around in the area and uh, transient. I was told that they were also part of the early migrant farm workers. Um, so it's very possible, but there's really no evidence that I found to corroborate any of that information. But it appears people took to it. They called her a gypsy queen. They acted like not only was she a gypsy, she was in charge of them all. I don't necessarily believe it in, to that degree because there was no evidence of it, uh, but she certainly could have been friends or made friends with them in their encampments. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? And yeah, about her, what was it, six other husbands? Did you say she was married? Six five other, six five total, other. yeah. And were any of them, um, you know, dead in an odd way or? Yes. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't, I don't want to give you spoilers, but yeah, there seems to be a theme there. Uh, um, at least one, you could say for certain, um, everyone believes she had something to do with it. Um, what about any other children that she, did she have other children with them? And just the one? No, she had one son who she named after her first husband. After the incident in Philadelphia, um, her son was taken away. Oh. Uh, Eastern State and that area of Pennsylvania was very Quaker at the time. And uh, the Society for Prevention to Cruelty to Children, SPCs or something yeah. like that, mm -hmm. took him away. Um, it's was impossible for me to find where he is now, but that would be a whole nother story. How he made out. I really do feel bad for him because it sounds like she was abusive to him. Um, you know, just kind of hitting him in public and things like that. But good questions. All of them. There's a lot answered in here. <laughs> but, uh, Thank you for coming, if that's it. I will be here to sign books if anyone wants them personalized or just jot down my name. I do appreciate every one of you coming tonight and listening to me ramble on. Um, like I said earlier, I don't think everyone was here, but the book was in process for almost five years. That's research and more research. And I really, I had this chart on the wall and I wasn't happy until I knew it was much as I could about her and 
now you can know as much as you can, whether you want to or not. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.